Welcome to the podcast. My name is Danny Cola. If this is your first time listening, make sure to hit subscribe on your favorite podcast platform so that you can join me in having some epic conversations that access higher levels of potential with creatives and professionals from all around the globe. Thank you so much for tuning in. Today's guest is my friend, Jake Fine. Jake is a content creator, and in the last year, Jake has taken his skills as a cameraman, editor, and fabulous storytelling abilities to build a business around shooting content for MMA fighters, primarily in the UFC. He's the main content creator for UFC bantamweight champion, Aljo Sterling, and he's also the producer of this very podcast you're listening to right now. I met Jake back in 2019 when he was a senior in high school, contemplating whether or not he should take a gap year and forgo college. And since then, he's followed his heart and put himself in positions where opportunities to shoot content has opened up many doors. In this podcast, we talk a little bit about the future of social media, reality versus the matrix. We talk about the controversial Andrew Tate and a balanced hustle to life and progressing forward. Uh, you can follow Jake on Instagram at Jake Fine Media. This was a fantastic podcast. I think Jake is a very inquisitive character, super curious, um, self-aware, and he's doing a really good job uh, developing his business, shooting content, uh, st- telling stories. Um, yeah, it was a very fun conversation, and I look forward to more conversations with Jake in the future. If you want to hear some more of what Jake Fine has to say, You can check out episode 124 of this very podcast, and this was shot, that last podcast was shot in 2019, well before uh, Jake was filming for UFC fighters and creating content like he is now, but uh, it's all awesome to see where he came from and what he's doing now, so please, without without further ado, enjoy this podcast. So you drove out to Vegas? I did drive my actually my dad came with we took nice. there's like th- three routes you can take two of them are like 26 hours of driving one of them's like 30 but there's like the north route and the south route that are the shorter ones and the north uh-huh. one goes through Colorado and Utah um so we we took that route so the first day was like just dry flat midwest land and then once we got to Denver it was it was beautiful mountains beautiful from denver to vegas there wasn't like a minute where there was not like a lot of mountains around us and that's in our country bro like i know being from the midwest it's flatlands it's just you know i mean i love the midwest i love chicago i love where we were born and where we grew up but there's mm-hmm. so much more beautiful nature pieces of land to see in other parts of the country and you live out there now hell yeah big boy dude it's like i was driving to the gym which is a mile and a half down the road and like like on that drive i saw like beautiful views of just mountains with snow caps That's around awesome. me it's crazy so much, for, so much for your gap year huh how's that going for you uh it's how many years has it it's like four years now four years since high school uh, three should I, should I go on my gap year or should i go to college i think you were like almost about to go to uic too i was yeah so i was going to i, I was taking some like summer classes that like transition you into yeah, the yeah. business program there and i was going to do like marketing and I was I did like one class and I went home and I was like, yo, I can't do this, Dad. Sorry. It wasn't even a real class. <laughs> yeah. And uh think about it though, really... like you major in marketing or major in business in college, and I mean, and then you get a job for a corporation and you do marketing, and it's probably so different than what you did in college. <laughs> yeah. And it's like I'm marketing now. Right. Like exactly. the stuff I do is marketing. So exactly. I think everybody who has a business has to market and then nobody teaches you the nuances of social media. And even if you did get a four year degree, everything that you learned or were trying to learn or what people professors are trying to teach changes instantaneously. Mm -hmm. 100%. And we're changing changing more and more and more. Do you think that we go to a, a peer to peer blockchain version of the Internet 
as opposed to social media, the centralized media. I know that we talked a little bit about it back when mm. I did that Justin Rizvani podcast. But do you think it gets to a point where centralized social media, the way it is right now, basically algorithms that feed you pieces of information that tell you what the truth is and what you're supposed to want to see or contrary evidence of what you know and what you think is true, pissing you off, getting you upset. Do you think it changes in the near future, like the next one to five years? Hmm. My, and if it does, my... like, and if it does, like, how do we change the way we market? You know, we're going to have to figure out a whole new strategy again. Here's like, my thing is, I don't really know. I never paid too much attention to crypto and blockchain and NFTs. Like I, I was vaguely aware of it as I, I am vaguely aware of it still, but I'm, it seems like a lot of that stuff to me, like became, it was a, like used to scam people yeah, or yeah, like, yeah. Uh, it didn't turn out to be like, it's, it's not now as valuable as it was promised to be like an NFT. Like I was talking about it with someone the other day. And like, it was supposed to like change the way we do contracts and mm -hmm. uh, change who owns, like change how ownership works of stuff on mm -hmm. the internet. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But like, it doesn't, it doesn't seem to have panned out yet to me. And well, I don't think really about know how long, think about how long it took for the internet as we know it now to pan out, right? The first right. versions of the internet were not nearly as fast. People were probably getting scammed all over the place when you started buying stuff online and true. you know what i'm saying and nobody was doing ubers or airbnbs or any of that stuff that we do via apps today mm -hmm. until like 15 20 years of the internet <laughs> right yeah yeah we'll have to and see now it's just like... the way everybody works it's how you know you, you you don't get a cab anymore you get an uber you don't necessarily stay at a hotel you get an airbnb you know, people are buying mm. on Amazon. People are buying with uh, DoorDash. Like that was never a thing 15 years ago. And that happened pretty quickly. And it's just the way of life now. The technology of blockchain and the lightning network, it's still all like what? People don't know it yet. So how are they supposed to integrate the way they do it with their life? Not yet anyway, until right. more and more people start making it a thing and people start having a deeper understanding of how it works and then how to relate it to their life and how their business runs or how they want to live life. Who knows? You know, who knows? It's still very new and not a lot of people know how it works. Not a lot of people are using it yet for their business, but there are people out there that are on the lightning network that are putting out content that are getting paid through people who just watch their content or share their content via Bitcoin or fractions of Bitcoin called mm -hmm. Satoshis. So let's say me and you are on the Zion network that's on the lightning network that's all backed by blockchain and the reason why it's so interesting is because that's set up to pay people and there's no middleman it's just from audience member to content creator boom there's no advertisers there's no yeah. way that people can manipulate what you see it's because you're you're following that person directly not via instagram you're on their zion network <laughs> And I know I still vaguely understand it, really. Um, that interview I did with Justin was just really short. And I mean, you know, you edited it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> anyway, um, yeah. what what did you want to, did you have anything planned that you wanted to really just like chat about? Or did you just want to riff? You want to talk about Andrew Tate? You want to talk about I, bodybuilding? You think that we have like some hot topics here that you, you thought about or what? Yeah. I mean, I, I know you said you wanted to talk about Tate. Um just a hot so, topic, and I, I I listened to him on long form podcasts, but at the end of the day, I just think he's a character. I don't know that he's really like that. He's playing a role. What do you think about that? Well, dude, like I sort, I thought that, um, and I met the guy, so right. which was crazy. Um, yeah, we were in Dubai getting ready for Al's fight, and we got invited to go on this yacht. And uh, Tate was there, so we all we all got to talk to him. You and, talked to uh, him, like personally. Yeah, I did, and his brother. And uh, yeah, it was. They seemed like dialed down versions of who they present themselves as on camera, but there was 
there was flashes where you were talking to Andrew where like he he got in that mode where he was like, mm. you know, very charismatic and like how Speaking, everyone sees him on camera. He speaks obviously very passionately. And there are some things that I think are interesting that he talks about, like how obviously I don't think anyone likes the fact that there's he, he talks about, you know, a small percentage of people trying to control others via social media or what have you. And he calls that the matrix, like the whole idea that we're all programmable and we're being programmed by the Internet unconsciously. He calls that the matrix, which mm -hmm. I don't know what I feel about that. I think the matrix is just another term for God, right? The fact that, yes, people are programmed and being programmed by social media and unconsciously being programmed by social media is something that nobody wants anyone to say, you know, mm. or people the higher up, they don't, they don't want people to know that that's what's happening. They just want to keep but you on your, they just want to keep you on your phone. They want to keep you logged in. They want to keep you scrolling. And that's that. What are your thoughts? Well, I was going to ask you, why do you think people, what, like, it seems like everyone kind of believes that there is a matrix, right? Like, when what, what you just referred to as the matrix, it seems like everyone, it's kind of open. Like that we're living like, in a computer simulation? Not like that, more like that there's people who are trying to control, like trying to input uh, like information into like the mass mm -hmm. society that we live mm -hmm. in. And mm -hmm. like control behavior on a mass scale. Yeah. And I don't consider that the matrix though. I just consider that reality. And that's how reality works. We have like individual consciousnesses. And then we have like this collective conscious, a hive mind where people are being programmed at scale and masses. And then there are certain narratives that a lot of people start to believe based on how algorithms are putting information out. And so many people spend so much time on the phone. We get distracted really easily and certain narratives come out. And over time, that becomes a new normal. And we forget that people did have the flu and had the cold before COVID. But then during the three years of COVID, the flu and the cold never existed. It was I tested positive for COVID, but had cold-like symptoms. And that was that. But now the narrative is like, oh, no, it's big, bad COVID out there. I'm not trying to say that it wasn't a big deal because, you know, people did get sick. It was an interesting flu cold like virus but not nearly as bad as what people made it out to be in the beginning but there's mm -hmm. still that trauma there's still that fear so in a sense like there's this like um you know mass formation psychosis people have thrown that term around where uh like big groups of people are taking in this idea of what's supposed to be true right and that becomes the reality so in that sense, that's a matrix, sure. But I just look at the matrix as the way reality works. And consciousness is infinite. That is like our body is here. It's finite. We're flowing through, you know, there's thoughts. We're Like I said, we're electrical beings. We have all these thoughts. But I don't necessarily think like, you know, the way he talks about the matrix is what the matrix is. I just look at when you say the matrix, it's more of like God, the hive mind. Okay. You know what I mean? But so do you think like like before there was the internet, did people get swayed how they do now? Like I didn't yeah. grow I grew up with social media. Yeah. So it's like that's all I know. I only live in I've only really lived in a world where I understood this dynamic. But like before that, was there Yeah. News, te television. If you, if you look at television, TV stands for television, and you break that down, you hear the phrase tell a vision. There's a vision. People tell it. People absorb the information. Next thing you know, that's the vision that they're now creating in their head, told to them by the news before the internet, which is just TV, and before that it was radio, and before that it was the written printing press and every time that there was a piece of new technology where people were getting information faster people deemed it the devil and it's like oh you can't read that that's toxic that's not the right information based on like the people who control the narrative wanted to 
I want people to be derailed and be like, no, this is not true. This is what the narrative is. And right now, like there isn't massive control when it comes to the internet. It's like a wild west and slowly, but surely, you know, with algorithms and people being canceled, like there are higher ups controlling what narratives are being put forth and what are being suppressed. Right. You talk about the vaccine, you talk about the negative impacts of the vaccine and you have a really big following. YouTube flags you and throws you off, especially in the 20 in the 2020, 2021, 2022. Right. Another big topic that's that you can't really talk about right now is uh, Roundup and glyphosate and how that's in our food. It's in our soil. It's like really having a negative impact on people's bodies. People are getting cancer earlier and earlier. Um like anybody talks about the danger of glyphosate, you get flagged. Anybody puts information out really? there that, oh yeah, oh yeah, fuck yeah. It, and like, it seems like, like if you just have like a lot of money as a corporation, you can just like pay to play how you want to exactly. in, this, in this world. And this is like some of the sad things about capitalism. Going back to mm-hmm. Andrew Tate, for example, like what I didn't like about him is that the way he made a shit ton of his money was that whole webcam thing where he had his couple of girlfriends like show their boobs on this website and people were like talking live to these ladies. And at first he said the ladies were in control and typing things back and forth. But then he realized that they were saying the wrong things to them. And he was the one that started taking over the keyboard, getting people emotionally manipulated to believe that these girls were going to meet with them at some point and they never did. But if you keep sending more and more and more money, we're going to keep building that relationship with you. And there's a lot of lonely guys out there. There's a lot of guys that think that, Oh, I'm meeting this girl online. We're going to meet together and we're going to fuck. But he was the guy manipulating these people's emotions. And those are the same people he's talking about that are losers and geeks and don't have real masculinity, but he's preying on them. And he's making money off of that millions of dollars a week. He was saying, "Yeah, it's actually like really fucked up when you, how you just said that was like just like saddening to hear, right? But that's how he yeah. made his money, and like you can do that in a capitalistic society, and it's legal and all that. Like he's just making money via a way of business. Like you know, I'm sure there's a lot of terms and stipulations that are contracted to." people that are signing up for these websites and what have you and having these relationships with these webcam girls or whatever but obviously they're not the ones chatting with them and they don't really want to meet with them they just want their money and that's the bottom line and yet his narrative is being a good example for men and like talking about how like you should never let your girl drive your car your wife should never have slept with anybody else but you you should never Uh, let her drive your car. Did I say that already? (laughs) You know, stuff like that. (laughs) It's like, it's like, what? All right. You know, and I'm in a relationship with a woman the last 14 years and I don't agree with any of that. I feel like like, he also encourages men to like, be like Hugh Hefner almost. Yeah. Like, you know, you're the goal in life as a man is to become rich and like famous and then have like thousands of girls, like, like as you get older, the girls keep staying the same age and you just have like tons of 21 yeah. year old models. Yeah. And you can and have as like, many girlfriends as you want. And yet he believes in marriage and he believes in protecting a woman, but then he does all these things. And that's not what that's not in line with what he's saying. You know what I mean? Yeah. So it's like, I feel it's like scum, it's scummy. Don't, do you, don't you think like society would be better if more people were encouraged to get married and have families? Do I think society would be better if they were encouraged to do that? Because, because, and I ask because it's it feels like that's becoming a less popular yeah. notion for whatever reason. But it seems like that that the fact that it's becoming less popular has ne- has a less um, it has more it has negative impacts on society that it's becoming a less popular thing to get married and have kids. Sure. Well, at the end of the day, like we need to make sure that our the, the mothers of our children and our children are comforted and that they have good positive role models. And there's something very interesting between the bond between father and son that 
there's only the communication between father and son that uh, uh, the child, the son specifically, could really understand certain notions and aspects of life and masculinity that could only be delivered from father-son relationship, not mother-son relationship. The mother-son relationship is different. It's more uh, of this, um, you know, um, I guess, nurturing factor, right? Um, giving them food, warmth, love, hugs, touches. Not that the man is not able to do that too. Like, a, you know, hugging your son, kissing your son, making him feel that there's this physical connection. Yes, it's, it's true. But also, like, there's a line that a, a father uh, delivers to their son that is very straight and narrow for the kid to understand. And that could only be delivered by the father. And I really think father-son relationships are really important. I think having strong-knit uh connection with mother and father is also really important, right? The kids have to know that the father loves their mother and it will do anything to take care of them. And this is only showing the kid how to live as they get older, right? To have one woman, to have somebody that they love, to have somebody that they cherish and connect with. And ultimately that super strong bond develops a really strong mentality in the kid, you know? So if a kid is growing up without that, you know, strong masculine father connection and strong masculine mother connection, the interdependent of the mother and father with the baby and how that kid grows up, I think that's super important. And if it's not pushed, and not that it's not pushed, right? It's just it needs to be talked about in a positive way that that's, you know, something that people should strive for. Not to say that you can't have you know, your fun growing up and have experiences and have multiple women, maybe date a couple at the same time, as long as like, look at Paul check, he's got two wives, but at the same time, like he's clear with his boundaries and his expectations and everybody's on the same page. Like, I don't think there's anything wrong with that if everyone's on the same page, but you can't be saying like, okay, I could have five girlfriends, but you can't have anybody else. Right. I can have all the cars. I'm driving. The money's in my name. The house is in my name. Everything's in my name. You're just the side piece. Right. Like, I think that's a little out of balance. Right. Mm. And yeah. So I, I'm not, I'm not sure what the right answer is, but I know that having a love, a, a loving, strong relationship myself and raising a family and uh, just the way I have, I have relationships with, you know, business partners and customers and stuff like all that stuff in my romantic relationship kind of carries over, you know, clear boundaries, clear expectations. Um, we have to request in a specific way. We have to talk about like what our feelings are and we have to be very clear on how we express our feelings, our own personal requests and in a way that's not demeaning or disrespectful right? Like life is all about relationships. Business is all about relationships. And then at the same time, like you talk about Andrew Tate making his money in an unethical way. Like, I just think that's scummy. And I think the matrix or reality will, or karma will come back and haunt you at some point. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like yeah. you say things into existence, like that's very powerful. You, you say things out in the, in real time that has a vibration, it has a frequency and you match with people that are hearing your message that resonate on that same level, right? That guy keeps talking about how it's already done. I'm going to get flagged first. Then the second thing is I'm going to get in jail. And the third thing is I'm going to die. They're going to kill me. He's saying these things out in existence, right? And things keep happening the way he's saying it. <laughs> huh? Right. Well, so, so it, I, I always wonder like if he, if he was doing, if he was doing things that he knows are, gonna get him arrested and he knows then he had then is he like is he predicting what's gonna happen or is he setting himself up for this narrative for he's when he gets arrested it. that he knows he, what's happening yeah he's attracting like, it did he know he was gonna get arrested and then say hey they're gonna come get me because the matrix doesn't want me to talk so that he could like win the court of public opinion mm, yeah it makes sense maybe maybe he knew he was going to get arrested and he knew he was doing something foul but at the same time like if he is unethically making millions of dollars like just manipulating people's emotions men specifically right he was the one manipulating men hey chrissy what's up he was the one manipulating men to keep paying millions of dollars to be with these women via the internet 
and kept them on a hook. And then he said, like, you know, when it came to the point where they were going to meet, like the woman and the man thought they were going to meet, he would fabricate an excuse. And then it would die down. And he said three months later, they would come back like clockwork. And then the cycle would happen all over again. And they probably had hundreds, if not thousands of these dudes falling in love with these girls. And these guys were just paying. <laughs> and they kept paying and they kept paying. So it's like, it's if crazy. You're doing, if you're doing something like that, why wouldn't you be human trafficking? Why wouldn't you be raping women or other like raping people in an, in, a, in another way? Like he was like he didn't physically rape these men, but he was raping them financially. Obviously, he wasn't meeting what they thought was going to be what they were going to get at the end of it. Like those girls weren't going to meet them. Scam. Yeah, like he knew that he was fucking these dudes over. He knew basically. it. He knew it. And I just heard audio yesterday that came out. Uh, of like more evidence that he like raped women like another whole mm. piece of audio so yeah it just mm. seems like he he conf like uh what's the word he tricked us all yeah right and then again he's a character and there's a lot of people out there on social media that are playing these characters and because the social media is engineered with likes and follows and all this stuff like a lot of these guys they grew up trying to get all these likes and follows and then they embody this persona and before they know it they become this persona and that's just their personal personality or you know they're faking it to a certain degree and they keep getting likes and views and all this stuff and all this attention and that's what they got to keep doing to keep the attention going and it's this mm -hmm. ongoing effect and it just becomes who they are and i don't know in, in my life like I honestly feel like being honest is the best policy because karma will come back for you, you know, in one way, shape or form, you know? So in a relationship, you got to be truthful and honest and, and, and share what those, like I said, those boundaries are and adhere to those things. That's how relationships become stronger and stronger. And, you know, when you have a very good dynamic on a team, the sky's the limit. You know, I've been part of very good sports teams in my life and there's a very good, like, dynamic there's good chemistry between the people everyone knows their role everyone really cares and wants to be there and emotionally uh, put everything out there and i think that's how you achieve things make changes in the world on bigger scales when your relationships are really tight also like when it comes to business you have to have a clear why and when everybody in the team is on board with that why then good things or coherent things will unfold because of that. But if you're basing your business on a fucking lie, at some point it's going to crumble to pieces. Don't you think? Yeah. I think anything like if you look at history, everything that's built tyrannically and ran tyrannically. Yeah. It falls. It just never lasts. Like it goes up really fast and it falls down really fast. Uh, Andrew Tate's a good example of that. You know, there's plenty of nations that got powerful really quickly and felt uh, Nazi Germany got powerfully mm -hmm. really quickly mm -hmm. and lost its power really quickly. Mm -hmm. Kanye West became an eleven billion dollar man and lost it really quickly. He's Meanwhile, another there's one. other it's very weird. Yeah, I mean, like I I had predicted years ago because Kanye kept getting so like you know there's like Kanye and Jay Z right. Jay Z has slowly built his net worth to become a billionaire. That's been like very sustainable. He's done very good business. And Kanye became a billionaire really quickly and surpassed Jay Z really quickly in in billion. Like he became like a twelve billion dollar man. Jay Z the two billion dollar man. And I had predicted years ago that because Kanye's like so crazy and it happened so fast, just the nature of the universe is if it happens that fast, it's going to come back down mm. really fast too. And now mm. look where they both are. Yeah, Kanye Kanye's not even a billionaire anymore. Yeah, I mean, who knows really like how much money these people have and what that even means? Like, how is it tied up? Yeah, who? You know I, mean, I mean, I can't tell you what is that. That's just what people say. But that's what yeah. people say. Like, we don't know yeah. shit. We just that's think true. that we know. But the you story is I mean? still there's truth in that story, even if that's like there's the truth and then there's truth, and I think that story is just true. Like, uh, like just the that that moral of that story is true. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, I don't know much about Kanye. I just know that his message is being very misconstrued, but also at the same time, I don't think it's really thought out super clearly. He wants to be the ruler of the free world, and then at the same time, like he's he's making like derogatory comments and like as a thing, like you're you're sharing your message in a negative way that doesn't resonate with people or it resonates with the wrong people. Yeah. You know what I mean? Um, I mean so yeah, man. You said like anti-Semitic shit. You pissed off a lot of people. Like, <laughs> yeah. is, that be- is that the best way to go about stating a clear message and how we can, we can prosper and move on? Like, I don't, I don't know. I don't think it is. I, I mean, clearly it didn't work but, out so well. But at, at the same time, like, what is he really trying to say? You know, basically, is there, yeah. Is there something like underlying that's super negative that that people are like running the world? You know, what I mean, are there really evil people that are running the world? That's that that I feel like that message is very like popular as an since ethos right now. Of, since the dawn of time, there's always been talk about a small group of people are trying to control things. I think it's innate in human nature. Yeah, and I just wonder, like, like if if I didn't have Twitter, would I even think about that too much? Like, is it that, like, because it's such a popular narrative on social media, but do you think it's, like, if you go outside, do you feel, like, going to the store or, like, going to the gym, do you feel like it's, like, oh, there, people are controlling me right now? Not really. During, during the pandemic, I did. Then, yeah. Right? So, like... You know, I, I'm in a different story because I was already an independent freelance business person contracting mm-hmm. my own clients and training my own people backed right. by nobody, just funding myself. I bought my own equipment. I would go door to door, bought my own car, pay for my own gas. The only thing would have to be the agreement with the client. I'm going over to train you for this hour. It's this much. Boom. Next person. Same thing. Right. I had nobody else hovering over me to tell me to put a mask on or get a vaccine or show my passes or anything like that. So if I didn't, if I wasn't a freelance person during that time, and I was a high school teacher, like I used to be where I met you, you know, then I would go to work and then someone says, Hey, you you have to wear a mask. And then you have to show me your vaccine card. I would feel like that's pretty controlling. Now you're telling me I got what I got to do with my body just to keep my, my life sustaining. That, that Um, didn't, that didn't feel, it didn't feel good for me. You know, I was just like, all right, well, I don't want to do that. So if I don't want to do that, I can't work here anymore. Is that what you're saying? Even though, you know, like I'm a good high quality teacher, educator, connecting with kids. So it's not about that anymore. It's about what I put in my body. And you're telling me I got to get, I got to get the shot. So like <clears throat> it didn't resonate with me at all. I never once thought about getting it. Not one time. And I don't want to be con- too controversial, but like that, that, to me, sounds like a little bit of control. So when you go out there and you ask that question, do you feel like you're being controlled? Okay, you go into the gym. The gym asks for your vaccine card. Well, really? now I'm saying. Not now, but that's no. because, like, in Amer- in America, like, there was a lot of people pushing against that. And over time, we've mm-hmm. got to know the real truth. But, like, in Europe, in Italy, for example, like, they had 95% compliance rates. You had to have... Uh, three vaccination cards in order, uh, three vaccines in order to get a super green pass, which gave you permission to use transportation, which gave you permission to go into any sort of like public place, go to stadiums, concerts. Like the, it, it, there was a green pass for the first two vaccines, and then there was the super green pass for the third one, and it was all on your phone, and you had to get scanned. You know, my dad is still having issues coming to the United States because he's not a citizen and never got vaxxed when he was out there. So, like, it's still kind of a problem. Like, he's kind of landlocked and can't go anywhere until he shows proof that he got vaccinated. So that, to me, is, like, kind of shaky. Kind of, It's kind of weird. Like, I don't want to yeah. live in a world like that. I don't want my kid to grow up in a world like that. But if we don't stand up and say things, then they're just going to keep government officials, whoever's in control, will keep just pushing the goalpost backwards. Like, I don't know if you remember... March 2020, it was everybody stay home, push, uh, stay home for two weeks, flatten the curve. Okay. And everyone really enforced masks. And then 
two and a half months later, masks started coming down. People started opening up, going to eat outside. And then it was a real push again. Got to wear the masks. New variant. Everyone mm-hmm. went crazy. And then we went back into November in 2020. And then we did lock second down lockdowns again. I don't know if you remember all this, but it would just kept like harsh protocols, punishment or not punishment, but just like harsh protocols. And then it would kind of reprieve. And then it would be a harsh protocol. And then it would kind of reprieve again. And that's what they call like when it comes to uh, like uh, collectively altering a perception of people, it has to come in waves. It has to come in waves in order for it to be more like true, you know, and before we know it, it's like it was normal to wear masks and everyone had to wear masks. And if you didn't wear a mask, you were a threat to society. And then there was this like guilt and shame to get people to do things. You know, you know, it's crazy. I don't want I just don't want to live in that world. Yeah, I mean, I don't I I hope I could only hope that that doesn't lead to more controlling from the top down. Why wouldn't it? If you had if we had 95 compliance rates in the United States, who knows where we'd be? Who knows? Like I got as an independent business person, like they started telling me I had to put signs up around my gym about showing your vaccine card. And like they sent me the emails of like, this is the pamphlet. This is what you have to print out. This is what you have to put on your door. Who's they? They, like local governments. Oh wow! You know, Not just like customers. No, local governments. They would say like, wow. hey, this is our policy in Cook County. My town is a part of Cook County, and this is what you have to do. And then neighboring wow. counties adopted the same thing. So it's like, but I'm in charge. Why do I have to do this? So now you're telling me who can come in and who can't come in? Who's policing this? And and like, why? (laughs) Oh, because people are going to get sick. And if you don't do that, you're the problem. Really? Really? Even though you're you're making, like for your business specifically, you're making people healthy. Like they they shut down, they shut down gyms told you to stay in your house but alcohol stores are open yeah grocery stores i mean obviously like, grocery stores but like home depots lowe's like all that stuff like those remained open so why did those stay open yeah okay they're essential but like nobody ever talked about exercise being essential you can you know like what and how many people you know i feel like all that did too is uh like i i feel like during the pandemic i became like all there was to do was like you know, wake up, edit some kind of video, be inside all day, play video games. And I might, I feel like my brain like melted over the pandemic. Yeah. Like it was, it, now I do like, there was, there was a come, like my family and I had a lot of bonding time, which was like, I I wish I cherished that more. Like that would be great. Like that was like, there was, there was like, it felt like that was a perk, but um, like looking back at it, like I became like lazier like I imagine that across 350 million people for in sure our country. for sure and you were probably lucky like you said that you had you bonded with your family and you guys got closer that's great a lot of these protocols split families up yeah I mean actually there was it it, it got shaky at times because you're just cramped in with people you know for sure for sure we need to have the like... autonomy we need to have the autonomy to like move about the way we want to you know yeah so then that leads me to another question it's like should people get canceled or should people get booted off social media? And like, if they, if they are like, what is that? Like, if they're like, what's that fine line? If you're inciting violence, if you're taking advantage of people, then you get booted. Or should we live in a society where like that never happens? And like, you have, you know, murderers, people inciting violence online. Like, where's that line? I get it. But yeah, You know, if somebody's talking about like whether or not, you know, the vaccines are a good idea and we have like a party talking about how it's not a good idea, don't do it. And then there's a party that talks about how you should do it and it's helpful. But then like the other side, the people who are saying don't take it, it may not be what we think it is, are the ones getting flagged. Doc, like the one on Joe Rogan for specifically rings a bell, Dr. Robert Malone, who apparently yeah. has nine patents on mRNA vaccines, took the vaccine himself, and then is stating all the contrary stuff that nobody's talking about. They wanted to take that off the internet. 
why? I think it's because, um, I think it's simple. Like most of these companies just want to be in, like, they don't want to be labeled as like bad. And like the media companies don't want to lose their advertising dollars. Apparently 90% of advertising dollars are big pharma. Yeah, for sure. Some, some crazy number. So it's like, and if you're like a, if you're like a big TV media company and that's, it's a low margin business already. And then your biggest advertiser is the, the people who make the, the Vax. It's yeah. like, what do you, I think it's as simple as that. Yeah. 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 For sure. And, and I think, I mean, luckily we had, but is that right? Do you want to, do you want to live, do no, you wanna live I in don't. a world like that? I don't want to raise kids in a world like that. Imagine the, just the the difference in the past four years if pharma big pharma wasn't allowed to advertise or sponsor companies that would never be the thing and never be there would never be a thing imagine the different world we'd be living there, in. dude there are people out there that think that like the next thing that comes out there will be a shot or a vaccine or injection for every ailment that comes out oh you have the gene for alzheimer's take this pill take this shot you're cured Oh, you have, uh, you know, this that runs into your family. Oh, we have a shot for that. Oh, you have this that runs in your family. Oh, we have a shot for that. And that's the direction it's going. I did a podcast with a guy that predicted that. And he feels like it's at some point, every single ailment that we have out there, boom, we have a shot or vaccine for it. And that's how we're going to go about health and wellness. But we both know, well, there's a lot of people that don't know, but I don't, I think health and wellness are very complex and it's not just a matter of having a shot or not having the shot. That's going to make you thrive. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's, it's but, funny you mentioned Alzheimer's because, uh, who's the actor that, uh, the, the Thor Chris Hemsworth. Yeah. So I'll tee this up for you. Chris Hemsworth. It, it, he did like a, like some kind of gene test that yeah. where the doctors basically told him he had the gene that makes him like 27 times more likely to right. get yeah. Alzheimer's. And so then that this was like a big story that was everywhere. Yep. But why, if you think about, they take a, they take a big celebrity who has a big name mm -hmm. who's on every, you know, big screen in the country right now. And they tell the story of, of that. It's like a weird television. Thing. Television. It's like, it's like weird, man. It's, plant the it's seed. like they plant the seed. And I know I guess it's a little conspiratorial, but like, like if you, Danny, if you found out you had that gene, no one's gonna tell your story because it, like, yeah, they won't just put you on that TV show and talk about it. But they take Chris Hemsworth and they talk about it with him. Yeah, because they want to plant the seed in in a in the people's minds. Like, oh, there's I don't know. I don't know. I'm not even like, I don't know why it's just weird. If you really think about it, it's just a weird thing. Why, why do we idolize people like that? Why does he get his story told? And then what are the consequences of it? It's just a weird thing. Uh, I don't think it's weird. I just think it makes sense when like somebody like that is very popular. People know him and you know, it's emotional because he's taking time off acting because he has this gene that's been detected now these 27% more likely to have Alzheimer's disease. But I don't think it's that simple. Like I watched both my grandparents deteriorate with neurodegenerative diseases, my grandmother with Alzheimer's and my grandfather with dementia. Mm -hmm. But like, um, you know, and my grandmother's mother also had Alzheimer's both passed pretty young. Like my grandmother started having really early signs at 67 years old. Okay. So think about this. She was super coherent. She worked uh, in a lunchroom in a hospital for her whole life. Okay. And she would come home, then make food for my grandpa. And they would have, you know, dinner and hang out at the house, watch TV, go to bed, go to work, do it all over again, 40 years. Then when my grandmother retired, <clears throat> she got a job with my father and my mother. They had a carry out fish place. And she was like, you know, breading shrimp, making shrimp batter on her feet, talking with people, active, engaged, whatever, until about like 65 years old, 66 years old. Then my father sold his business to his business partner, and then they didn't want my grandmother around anymore. So at 66, now she's at home all day long. 
my grandpa too, home all day long, no work. And he was a couple of years older and, um, you know, a high carbohydrate diet, pasta all the time, no, almost no activity at all. And, um, like really quickly you started seeing the first signs and you want to know what those were. She was looking at herself in the mirror and she didn't recognize herself. And then she starts talking with the person in the mirror. Like it's somebody else in the house. So she would confront my grandpa and be like, every time I go into the bathroom, the woman is standing in there. There's a woman there. I don't know who she is. And then she would go to my grandpa. Are you cheating on me? Are you hiding this woman in the bathroom? And he's like, what the fuck? Get, That's get creepy. Out of here. Dude, this was the first, this was the first like signs. And then I remember seeing her talk to the mirror. Like, you got to get out of here. This is my house. Get out of here. And then she would start hiding stuff hiding all their jewelry, hiding all their clothes. And it started getting so worse. Insane. It started getting worse and worse, you know? Um, so yeah, wow. it started getting, but you think that got kickstarted by them stopping work and stopping, stopping out everything. purpose basically. Oh, yeah. yeah. Yes. When you don't have like some sort of activity or some sort of uh, just like a way to contribute to society, then what is your brain working for? doesn't have to work as hard. Your heart doesn't have to work as hard. Your cells don't have to turn over as quickly. It's just like path of least resistance, you know? And then you get to a certain yeah. age and things start happening. Things start shifting. So, um, I have a theory that, uh, like your body builds itself to be good at whatever you, you put it through basically. So, I mean, this is obvious, but like, if you're sitting on the couch all day, you're just going to become soft and yeah. Your and, brain's going to atrophy. Less energy is going to be like, you're going to become tired and you're going to become acclimated to do that every day. Versus yeah, if then, you put yourself through the, the ringer, your body's going to harden. Or basically what, you know, we've been talking about here is like, you know, when we talk about cold plunges or we talk about exercise, like we talk about finding the right amount of resistance to keep a balance, you know, hormone level, balancing your stress, basically, right? Knowing when to push it and then knowing when to pu pull back, right? Mm -hmm. You can't be doing 100% in the weight room seven days a week, 360, 365 days a year. It's mm -hmm. not ultimately going to be your best. It's just not a smart way to go about it. You need to push and then reprieve, push and then reprieve. Like what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. But if you stay in that chronic state of like just over intense whatever exercise over intense work or really hard to manage relationships then you're going to be biting more than you can chew and you're going to have a hard time recovering and that's where the pain teacher starts showing itself and yeah. a lot of times people just stuff away the pain teacher and they just keep going 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 because that's what they that's the narrative the story they tell themselves over and over and over again based on programming and then Next thing you know, you find yourself in a you know physical pain, emotional pain, long enough, and then over time that becomes the new normal, and then it's just you're just trained. Oh, I've always had the shoulder pain. I've always had some stomach pain. Ah, oh, I just ignore it. You know, if you keep your check engine light for too long, and you just ignore it, and you just ignore it, and you just ignore it. You don't go to the shop. You don't get it checked. At some point, your car is gonna fail on you. Mm. You know, so we just gotta get good at detecting what those signs are. And finding balance in life of finding an appropriate challenge. I think that's all everything, you know, it's all about life, right? You got to find what those skills that you have are, how you can contribute to the world. And, you know, you have to have, I think part of it is having clear message to share with others because we're co-creating together. It's not just, you know, you by yourself individually living on this planet. You're co-creating with everybody that you interact with essentially. And, um, I think it's important to find those grooves. If you are not challenging yourself enough and you get into that boredom state, then your brain stops working. It stops building new neurological patterns. And, you know, what meditation does and what, you know, psychedelics do to a certain degree is, you know, allow your, your brain to, to reprogram. And um, it's powerful, you know. Uh, Tim Ferriss talks about how, like, you know, if you're skiing and there's all these people skiing down a slope and there's all these like grooves of the people's skis that are going through, every single person just kind of finds those grooves and keeps hitting those grooves until a 
fresh set of powder or snow comes on and now it's just like, oh, we can create new grooves, right? Doing this, like uh, the, the holistic stuff, the cold baths, the meditation, the fasting, it, um, psychedelics to a certain degree, it gives you a fret, like a, for a, sim a symbolic representation, it gives you a fresh set of powder to create new grooves, you know? Mm. And if you're just sedentary and not challenging yourself, you're going to essentially turn to mush. And I've watched both my grandparents start to turn to mush. So after uh, those signs started showing up in my grandma, I kept getting worse and worse, hiding shit, not recognizing herself anymore, started not, you know, to, you know, start to piss herself, shit herself. Then my grandpa was like, oh my God, this is real. I'm losing my wife in front of my face. And then oh he started going through the, the, the dementia process, shaking, he had Parkinson's, his skin oh. was really rough. Then he started going kind of cuckoo, like couldn't recognize himself anymore. Then started pissing and shitting himself. Couldn't really, uh, you know, do anything by himself anymore. Had to be watched 100%. And then he ended up passing before she did. Oh. Isn't that crazy? Not to get too morbid, but like I saw this in front of me happen. Why do you think that happened to them? Uh, I, you know, like I said, I think you can contribute that to a super sedentary lifestyle, highly inflammatory foods no purpose no meaning no like my grandfather was a barber he had customers for 40 years and even after he retired from his uh he didn't have a corporate job but he worked for uh you know a salon or a barber shop where he had people come to him and then he retired when he was 65 and then he started taking clients in his own house until he was like 75 and then maybe even earlier, maybe before that, maybe like 73 ish, but he took clients on for a little while. But then after that, you know, he, you know, my grandma started getting sick. He stopped taking clients, stopped bringing people in the house. And, you know, I think it's just a matter of time before you turn to mush without any sort of uh, sharpening of the sword. So to speak. if you were to make, if they said, Danny, we're losing our shit, we want you to come in and uh, like fix this for us. What would you like? What actions would you program for them to stop Fix. that deterioration from happening? Wow. In like retirement. I mean, I think that whole retirement model is dead anyway. Like, our generation is starting to think, like, you mean I have to commit myself to this one job for 30 some years? Like, for the, my teaching job, for example, um, TSA, t the, the teacher you know, uh, I don't know what they call them, the union, teachers union, the, mm -hmm. you know, the, the retirement system that's already been in place for years said that yeah. I had to work as a teacher until I was 67 years old in order to get some wow. sort of pension, right? 67. So I had to work all those years up until 67 in order to like stop working officially and get, you know, a normal income, which we don't yeah. know that it would even be there by the time I got to 65. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? If you worked for a, a different district, you know, like Oak, Oak Park River Forest, for example, was a good district to uh, retire from because like their stipulations were good. If you worked X amount of years, you can get 70% of your salary for the rest of your life. But you had yeah, to like, that's work. That's a sweet deal. Sweet deal, right? It's interesting. But I mean, it doesn't exist. That doesn't exist anymore. So I think about like, that was my mindset, you know, seven years ago to become a teacher, you know, find a, find a home, retire, and then, you know, get a sweet salary when I was done. But I don't think about it like that anymore. Like the way I'm working now, I can make triple what I did as in a year as a teacher and then orchestrate my own retirements when I want to now while I'm young, right? If I don't want to work for three weeks at a time, I don't don't have to work i mean i wouldn't i wouldn't be getting paid for what i was doing but you as, as a business owner you figure out how to do things like you do a certain amount of work for your steady cash flow you have your expenses yeah. and then you have your your net profit afterwards and like how much do you need to live okay great you make those calculations and you work the appropriate amount of hours and then with the i guess what's left over you buy assets and that's how you become wealthy you know and then you make yeah. your money work for you and mm -hmm. I'm still kind of learning this, 
but I would have never been able to get there if I was just a teacher. Never. Impossible. You know, with the um, way unless your time you like, is lived at home with your parents and like yeah. sent, saved all your money which, right away. But... Which fuck, fuck no, dude. I'm not. I don't want to. Yeah. The second I turned 18, I was like, I'm not. There's no way I can do this for long. I don't want to live with my mom and dad. Like, I think uh, when it comes to growth and development, at some point you have to break away from your parents. Your parents can't yeah. be, you know, on, you know, feeding you or helping you in your in your 20s yeah. you have to find a way to do it on your own and then there's this level of growth and development that happens when you don't have the net from under you anymore it's like okay i don't have the safety net of my parents i can't go to them i gotta figure it out on my own and that builds character i think it's really fucking yeah. important actually i think it's super important and it's something that my wife and i are struggling with right now with our baby like how much do we help versus how much do we give him the opportunity to fall and learn on his own you know, I mean, he's only four months, so we're not like, not we're not doing too much with that yeah. right now. But, uh, you know, just like, um, just sending him to daycare, for example, like we have to trust other people to take care of him while we're doing our thing. You know, ultimately, we'd like to be the ones being with him all the time. But you know, when you talk about like older societies where, uh, like all the women in the tribe would take care of everybody's baby, you know what I mean? And there was this like communal aspect to raising children and the men would go and, you know, find food and find new land and develop shelter and shade and find ways for the community to thrive. You know, the women would be the ones that are, you know, nurturing the babies and nurturing the young and raising them. And then the, the elders too, like the grandpas and the grandmas of the world would also be there to help raise the youth of the tribe and, we would move on. So it's like, yeah, we're in the stage that we kind of have to work, but she and I, my wife and I are trying to figure out ways where if we don't want to work, we don't, let's not work. Let's not do it for right now. Let's do what we want to do. But you know, she still has a corporate job. I have a little bit more flexibility, but at the same time, like I know what I have to do for X amount of dollars for cash flow, And then it's just buying assets after that. But I, interestingly, I did a podcast yesterday with Gary Lineham from human garage and mm -hmm. like, they're doing a gift economy basically right now with the way that they're orchestrating their, their lives. And I'm, I just, I'm like, they don't have, they don't use money. I mean, they do have money, but they're not thinking about money the way we do. Like they're constantly pumping out content to help people. They want to help a billion people with their fashion maneuvers and they get people to come help them and work with them and they house them, but they kind of like, these people do content for them. They they do all the tech stuff in exchange for learning how to do these fashion maneuvers on themselves. And Gary's a very interesting guy, and he's had real success like helping a lot of people with these fashion maneuvers where he was like manipulating people's fascia with his own hands, like like a massage therapist would. But then like he realized the more he was doing that, then people would still come back later on because they would get back in their old habits so now doing fashion maneuvers he's teaching people how to do them do these things to themselves like the other day or not the other day i'm gonna say a couple months ago me and you were like doing that sinking up where we put our hand underneath the elbow or underneath the armpit and we were twisting and turning the body and doing these breathing exercises apparently those twisty and turny pulling on the fascia and the skin like it helps alleviate tension mm. and um it helps people free up certain blocked areas, which allow them to become more pain free. And then I like to think about consciousness kind of flowing through better, you know, or clearer, yeah. and you get more understanding of what your purest nature is. So he was teaching all these people how to do and he's still doing that on his own. But I guess right now, my point is like, he's doing this like, sharing type of economy where he teaches people these fascial maneuvers, they come work for him in his house in Vancouver. And they set it up to where they're not really worried about money like you and I are working, paying bills. Because he's like, how are you supposed to help somebody to your fullest as a practitioner if you're worried constantly about paying your bills or buying this yeah. or that? I'm like, yeah, dude, I think about this all the time. Like I have overhead, you know, I have a house, I got a gym. The answer isn't more gyms. I don't want to do more gyms. I don't want to keep having more and more expenses. I just want to keep that flat, but continually trying to like, 
figure out ways to make more by working less. And this is the whole conundrum. You can do this over the internet, but again, like you can quickly find ways to do it unethically. And I don't want to be that guy because I know about karma and I'm like, I'm genuinely trying my best to add value into the world from like a really loving standpoint. I think that's really, really important. If you want to thrive in this reality, in this matrix, you got to put out the energy you're looking to receive. So if you're putting out energy that's manipulating, you're going to receive manipulating style of energy or attract that same type of resonance that you're putting out there. I think yeah. that, you know, in a sense, that's just reality. You know, whether you want to call it the matrix or not, whatever, whatever word that you want to use. But at the end of the day, I think unconditional love is where things have to come from. Love, joy, happiness, wholeness, peace. I think peace is a big one that people like tend to overlook. We want peace. We want internal peace. We want external peace. We want to have, want to be at peace with how we contribute to the world. And we don't want anyone looking over our shoulder. I think that's where we tense up. That's where we get all stressed out. And when we're stressed out, we have incoherent signals being transferred through our fascia, through our organs, through our nervous system. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? And that leads And that leads to destruction. That leads to incoherence. That leads to disease. And that leads to death and, and premature death, right? Nowadays, people are dying younger than ever with stage four cancer or you know, heart issues or, um, you know, diabetes, obesity, all that stuff. And, and they say um, it's all related to your diet. Like they say Alzheimer's is a metabolic issue. It, it's part of it for sure. Like I think that a highly inflammatory diet can contribute to it, but you have to know what food is inflammatory to your system and stop eating it. Problem is a lot of those foods are addicting as hell, you know? Yeah. Yeah. That's the and, problem. And and you know, social media, addicting as hell. We want to see that we want more followers, more likes. We want this video to go viral. We want our message. We're not like I'm not afraid to admit that like I want to have a little bit of a following. I want to have influence over people. I think that's also innate in human nature. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? But like seeking when it, it's power. never it's it's never enough. Yeah. We we're seeking power. We want some sort of control. We want to have like some sort of influence. And that can get to really like, I mean, if you're really, you know, you can get really sick about how much control you want, how much money you want, how much power you want, you know, like, again, 100%. what about peace? Where we, where, you know, where are we at with that? You know, let's, uh, let's start to wrap this up here. Cause I do got to bounce in a little bit. Yeah, bro. This is, this is good. This is fun. This is very good. Yeah. But I, I do have, um, I do have some more podcasts. I'm doing one. I did one yesterday. We did one today. Next week, I have one on the 18th, and I have two the following week with some, you know, bigger names, which I'm excited to connect with. Sick. Um, uh, Gary V, for example, is one of those guys that pushes work-life balance, and I think maybe we'll end it here. Um, he was one of the guys that I that really inspired me to keep going on social media and, you know, build my business via social media. You know, I can probably go off social media tomorrow and still have a sustaining training business via word of mouth and people in my community but the goal is to break beyond that and be on a national stage at some point um maybe a global stage who knows but that guy got divorced did you know that and he's dating some other like supermodel that's like um, yeah. over instagram and you know that guy was pushing you know family and and balance over all this stuff but like he's crazy persistent with all this stuff yeah he has big teams and all that stuff but like at some point his wife got turned off and was like, I don't care that you're the father of my children, but we're not doing this shit anymore. That freaks me yeah. out. I don't ever want to get to that point. I want to know before anything else where like there's a incoherent connection between my wife and I before it ever, ever gets to that point. Yeah. You know? that's, without, when I without saw that, the, I was like, he, I, how many times did he say like, he, like he doesn't, he's not worried about, you know, his, like, he's willing to take that risk. He said that, sure. like, yeah, how I, maybe my family won't feel good about me, but I have to do what I'm doing. And then it didn't take that long really for his wife to divorce him, which I was yeah. like, wow, no, is, dude, this worth, fuck, is it worth it to up. be that powerful? Right. And have that much influence. I, I don't think it's that worth it, dude. No. Last year we lost our cat. We moved into a new house. Okay. And uh long story short, we thought we lost the cat. 
the cat got stuck in some of the vents in our house because we were like remodeling the floors and stuff. And for six days, we went without our cat. Okay. And I know it's like first world problems. We have this emotional attachment to our animals. We fucking yeah. lost the cat for six days. So that's those six days that I went to work and training my clients and like building my business because it's so important to me and having an effect on the world. It was hard to do any of that because my family was in an incoherent state. My wife was, you know, four months pregnant at the time. She was an emotional wreck because she didn't know where this fucking cat was. And like there was a problem with my family. Nothing else mattered. I didn't care wow. about anything else. Wow. You know what I mean? you, even even a cat. Yeah. Yeah. Something like, I mean, it's part of our family, you know, like we have two yeah. dogs, we have a cat. It's me and my wife now and the baby and we have this house and like we love living where we live. We have a, a wonderful life, you know, but when there's one little thing off with your family like that, like I don't give a shit about my business. I don't give a shit about like what I'm doing after that. Like all I care about right now is making my family, making sure my family is like, in a position where we're happy, healthy, we're feeling yeah. whole and calm and, you know, we're developing the next generation in a very like, you know, just in, um, an in intentional manner. Like, you know, I want to make yeah. sure that my kid has what he needs to figure out his role in the world and bottom line, you know, my wife too, same thing. I want her, I want to make sure that she knows that she's fully physically, mentally, emotionally supported with what I bring to the table. And like, that's part of our agreement in our relationship. Like I will go above and beyond for her. And am I perfect? Fuck no. Dude, I make mistakes all the time, but I definitely want to know before it ever gets to that point where she's like, you know, Hey, this is not working out. Like you're putting too much effort in your business, which is some, one of my big fears is like how much effort and energy am I putting into this? Yeah. And how much effort and energy am I putting in and being present at home? Cause you know, when we're making content and we're coming up with ideas, like, you know, I'm a thinker. I'm a creative. I love like being in th lost in thought, but am I not being at present with my family when I'm being lost in thought? You know, you can't be in both places at once. You just got to designate the, the time in an appropriate manner. And, you know, when you're at home, you're at home and there's no work. And when you're at work, you do what you got to do until you're done. And then that's it. So like there's a double-edged sword being really diligent and scheduled can be tedious, but it also being disciplined can equal freedom at the same time. But then if you're too willy nilly and free and you're not like scheduling enough, then things can get kind of chaotic and they can be a little bit more unorganized. And that doesn't mean growth. Yeah. You know what I mean? So it's and like then, double edged yeah, sword. Suddenly suddenly something gets fucked up because you weren't responsible and then right, now you're right have to go you don't have any right. freedom. You have to go fix that thing. Right, right. And that can be very tiring but anyway what are your last thoughts i gotta bounce here great episode this was fun fuck yeah let's keep doing it all right yeah um sure. okay, i'm i'm gonna have to uh, i'll send you all the stuff for human garage by the end of the night do you think that we can post it tomorrow for the friday yeah. the friday episode yeah is that too is that too short of notice or what do you want it up in the morning i mean it's up to you. You're the one. I mean, I'm getting it to you super late. So, yeah, I'm, I think I can. I, yeah. All right. I'll just, I'll send it All over right. to you right now. All right. Send me this too. All right. I'll send you this too. All right, buddy. All you're right, the man. Cool. I'm happy for yeah. you. I'm happy that you're in uh, Las Vegas doing your thing. Thanks, brother. Yep. Yeah. It's pretty sick out here. Fuck yeah, dude. To the next All step. Right. See ya. Bro, bro. See you later.